this boy in her age group raised his hand and he said, you know, people keep telling me to push my emotions down and my feelings down. And he said, and sometimes I'm worried if I keep pushing them down, that I'm not going to be able to find them when I need them. That boy, by the way, is 12 years old, and he's already getting the messaging that it's not okay to have feelings, and that boys are supposed to be strong, and that feelings are for girls and women. Today, we're exploring the effects of traditional toxic masculinity on boyhood development. My guest is Rachel Gisa. She's a journalist, columnist, and the author of Boys, What It Means to Become a Man. We discuss the dangers of raising children in the man box and the importance of expanding our current definition of courage to include being vulnerable and authentic and that it's okay to cry as a boy and a man. This is an important conversation. And during the editing of this episode, I realized that there's a weird clicking noise coming from my guest's audio track, but it doesn't matter. Because what we're talking about here is crucial to changing the way we raise our children so that they can be softer and more in touch with what's real. Connection, love, intimacy, authenticity. I'm so grateful for this conversation. My name is Sean Galanos, and this is The Love Drive. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Rachel Giza, and I'm the author of the book, Boys, What It Means to Become a Man. Could you tell me a little bit about like what inspired you to write this book? So I've been working as a journalist for more than 20 years, and a lot of my work has focused on uh, feminism, on politics, on gender equality, looking at it through the lens of girls and women and how to fight for equality for, for girls and women and looking at the impact of gender stereotypes and biases on the opportunities that girls and women have in the world. And so these issues were sort of always things that I'd been, I'd been thinking about. And then um, my wife and I became the parents of a boy. And the minute we brought him home, so he was one when we brought him home, he was adopted. We heard about our son and six weeks later, we brought him home. So we didn't go through the experience that parents who come to parenting through pregnancy do where you're debating whether or not you find out the gender of your child. And there's that big moment of it's a boy or it's a girl. With us, it was this very quick experience of not being parents. Six, six weeks later, we were parents to a one-year-old boy. Almost immediately, we would hear from family members or friends when we would say something that our son liked or something that our son did. People would say, oh, that's such a typical boy, or he's just like a boy, or boys are like that, or don't worry, because that's just how boys are. And it was really striking to me, having spent all this time thinking about gender norms and stereotypes and their impact on girls and women, to be confronted with these rules and norms and expectations that people would uh, you know, apply to our son. You know, I was in the process of trying to figure out how to, you know, understand who my son was as a full human being and sort of figure out what was, what were his particularities, what was his personality, his temp temperament, his way of being in the world. And it was fascinating to me when, when people would say, well, that he just does that because he's a boy or that's what all boys do or boys are like that or, or that's so unusual for a boy. You know, as he got older, that became more pronounced. And I got really curious about, you know, what it means to, what it meant for him to grow up in the world, what it meant for him to absorb the messages that he was hearing. And so I started to read about it and think about it. And then partway through the process, um, when my son was about 10 years old, I had an opportunity to write a story for the Walrus magazine about um, a program in Calgary called Wise Guys, which is a 
a sexual, it's like, it's a program, it's a sex ed program, basically like a comprehensive sex ed program for young men in grade nine. So they're about 14 years old, which talks about sex ed in the context of talking about um, emotional intelligence, uh, being in community, self-awareness, uh, decency, understanding your own um, value system and moral code, understanding power dynamics in the world. And I found that it was such a uh, it was a program that didn't that I didn't see elsewhere, and I thought it was so meaningful. This program at that moment, which was sort of slightly before Me Too, but when we were beginning to have these conversations about questions of consent and questions of um, you know gender equality and gender dynamics, that article that I wrote um, ended up becoming my book. Uh, I sort of began to delve deeper in the stuff that I was experiencing and feeling as a parent of a boy and also learning about um, as a journalist as I looked into these questions of gender norms and expectations, but how they were applied to boys and young men. And you did a lot of research. I mean, it's it's sort of incredible the, the depth and breadth of research that you did for this book. And it's chock full of studies and of, of a lot of examples of how I don't know, the traditional narrative of mass of like what it means to be a man is actually very detrimental to how boys are to like boyhood development. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't set them up well for, for nowadays. Yeah. I think it used to work pretty well in the past and it's no longer really relevant. Yeah. And I'd argue it didn't always work that well in the, in the past either. Um, uh, but you know, there, there's a term, there's a, there's a, a sort of a metaphor or an idea that sociologists use called the man box, which is, um, you know, looking at very sort of stereotypical and traditional masculine behaviors. So if you were to think of the kind of Marlboro man or the macho man stereotype. So, you know, being, being the breadwinner, um, being sexually aggressive, um, you know, being conventionally attractive, being heterosexual, being physically strong, being stoic, uh, being emotionless, being, uh, you know, courageous, you know, at all costs, um, never crying. Um, so those sorts of very stereotypical ideas we have about, you know, what it means to be a quote unquote real man. So that man box um, is what you might think of if you think about sort of the old fashioned traditional ideal of idea of manliness. I think it's still very alive and well today. But what we know are, you know, all the qualities that it takes to be like a real man are often very detrimental to being a healthy person or a good man at times. So, you know, shutting off all your emotions and never, never expressing any kind of vulnerability, believing you have to do it all on your own and can never ask for help. I mean, that is a recipe for isolation, depression, um, low self-esteem, you know, being told that you have to be, you know, a breadwinner at all costs what does that mean in an economy that is incredibly challenging for everyone, including men, to, to find sort of stable employment? You know, if you're told that being sexually aggressive and having sexual conquests are the most important aspects of being a male, how then do we talk about women's pleasure or consent in that dynamic? And so, you know, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying masculinity is bad or, or, or being male is bad, but I think that men and boys get a lot of messages telling them that there is a very narrow and limited way of being a real man. And that very narrow and limited way is very harmful for boys and men. And for everybody that they come into contact with. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there, there was something that sort of jumped out at me while I was reading the book was that uh, the, the idea that loneliness is actually more detrimental and more dangerous than, uh, than say, obesity, right? Is a, is a bigger killer than obesity, uh, especially in men. Yeah. Because it's so it's hard to form friendships. It's hard... <sighs> If we're rejected in in sort of an overture of trying to make a friend, we're like we're 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 more likely to not try that again because of how painful it was. We're not taught to be vulnerable. We're not taught to to 
for it to be okay for people to reject us. And so instead of being rejected again, we just won't do it and we'll live, we'll live in, in isolation. It's sad. Yeah, it is very sad. And I think that, um, I mean, I think you've hit on all these excellent points about that. I looked at the work of uh, an American academic, who she's a sociologist at NYU, Niobe Way, and she has done terrific work studying boys' friendships and particularly adolescent boys' friendships. And what she found was, you know, I think we have these cultural stereotypes that, you know, girls have these very intimate friendships and boys have these very superficial friendships. I mean, I think that's what we believe is that, you know, boys don't want to talk about their feelings. They're not as intimate with their male friends as, as we imagine two girls to be. But in fact, what uh, what Professor Wei found was that boys uh, throughout childhood and into their early adolescence very desperately want a connection with other boys that is meaningful and sustaining and helpful and supportive. They are really looking for intimacy with their male friends. And to a certain point, they have it. But then as they get older, um, because of these messages around being a real man, because of homophobia that gets very suspicious about two men having an intimate connection to one another, a lot of boys pull back from their intimate friendships with other boys to focus more on, say, a romantic relationship with a girl if those boys are straight. And then as those boys turn into men and get older, it can be much harder for guys once they are in their, say, late teens, 20s, and 30s to make friends with other men. And we know that friendship is inoculates us against things like depression, like so, social isolation. Um, and we know we are experiencing right now a loneliness epidemic. We are ever more connected, but ever more disconnected when it comes to intimate, intimate ties. And so I think the messages we say to boys, which is, to tell them that, you know, boys shouldn't be intimate with one another, that that's kind of a girly thing or that shows weakness. I think we put boys on this path towards a manhood that can be quite lonely, where a lot of men, they talk about their best friend being, if they're straight, their female partner, which is wonderful. But I think I, I heard from a lot of men writing this book, and I'd be curious to hear sort of from your, your own experience and what you hear from other men. I, I heard from a lot of men saying, that they would love to have more male friendships, that they would love to have more intimate connections with their male friends, that that is something they genuinely crave. I crave that as well. I moved from California to Montreal maybe three years ago now and have had to, to build a new friend group. And it was, it's been much easier for me to find female friends than it has been to find male friends. And I, I did have a male friend and we actually had a, we, we broke up. We had like a, and we're actually seeing each other tomorrow for the first time in a year. And so it's been, it's been challenging for me to really find someone. I, I do have now a new male friendship and people, it's funny, some, some uh, women in our lives, cause we all, we all have the same friend have referred to it as a bromance. And I saw that being uh, talked about in your book as sort of like, why do we have to romanticize male friendship? Like, why can't it just be okay for men to be intimate and vulnerable together and to have yeah. a, an emotionally connected relationship? Yeah. And I do. I mean, you know, that term bromance, it, you're right. It's something that I talk about in the book because it feels like it needs to put kind of quotation marks around two men having a friendship, that it needs to kind of wink at it a little bit because to suggest that two men might genuinely just really enjoy being, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, you would never refer, like you would never put the same kind of quote marks or be cutesy about two women being friends. I think that we have this understanding about the value of female friendship as somewhat of a sacred thing almost. And I think that we, we feel like we need to be cutesy around two grown men who want to have male friendships. And, you know, in, in speaking of hockey, there's actually a, a father of uh, a boy that my son has played hockey with for years. And he and I were talking uh, one day at the rink and this man was saying that he plays in like a, like an old guys beer league and they've been playing together for 30 years. Yeah. Big thumbs up to the old guys beer league. And they've been playing together for 30 years. And 
you know, every week, um, no matter what, they get together, they play hockey, and they go out afterwards, and they have beer and burgers or pizza. And he said, you know, uh, we have seen each other through marriages, childbirth, miscarriages, divorces, deaths of parents. And he said, you know, these are my guys. Like, like I have this kind of two hours a week where I feel like I can be around people who aren't my family, but who have known me for years, who have seen me through difficult stuff, who, where I can really be myself. And I, and it is like one of the most important and sustaining things in his life that he is part of this community of men. And I think he gets a great deal out of being a husband and a great deal about being a father, but this is really, this is a very special thing for him. And, and again, I heard that a lot from so many men saying that, and I, and I think on the other side of it too, for, you know, for, for women, I mean, I'm partnered with a woman, but the women I know that are partnered with men, I think they often feel that they have to do a lot of the emotional labor in their, in their partnerships. And I think the women whose part male partners have a solid friendship group, those men can find emotional sustenance elsewhere as well. So they're not putting all their eggs in the basket of their partnership. They're not only turning to their wife or girlfriend or spouse when they're struggling or when they're having a hard time. They're also able to turn to their male friends and ask their male friends for support. And I think that that is really important when it comes to people who are in male-female relationships, that women don't feel like the burden of being emotionally savvy, emotionally supportive falls on them. That I think it's really important for those relationships for men to know that they have that kind of resilience and support network outside of their romantic relationship. I think that men, some, some men, that they need to feel safe knowing that it's going to be okay to talk to your buddy about being sad because you got rejected or uh, you have an STI or you know, you're, you, some, some stuff that we really need to share. Some men need to feel safe that it's okay to do that. And it doesn't mean that you're less of a man, right? Because the fear is that you'll be called gay, right? Or yeah. you'll be called, you know, you'll be called all sorts of things that aren't, that don't fit in the man box. And then you're going to have a lot of cognitive dissonance between, hey, I'm a man, but I'm, I'm like emotionally sensitive. Like that doesn't fit. But I mean, the friendships that I have, most of them, almost all of them, I can talk about anything with these guys. And it's important that we do because then, then I know that I'm not alone in feeling this thing imposter syndrome, not worthy, you know, not, not deserving of love, like all these things that guys don't typically talk about. And I need to be able to, because or else it just stays inside. And, and that's dangerous for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there, and I think especially in this moment, I mean, I even think in, you know, in looking at the attraction that that the the attraction that a lot of the kind of men's rights movement can hold for a lot of young men in particular, um, or like some of the more toxic strains of internet culture that a lot of young men are drawn into, um, even like you know extremist movements and groups like that. Um, those groups know to prey on lonely young guys. Like when you think about you know groups that are recruiting recruiting, um, you know, kids into say like a nationalist movement or a white nationalist movement. Um, they are, they are specifically targeting the isolated young men who feel friendless, who feel like they don't have a community who, um, you know, don't know how to be in the world. And so I think that, um, people period want to find their community. They want to find their group. They want to find their place. And I think for, you know, young men in particular who are in a moment in time, which can feel quite confusing and um, the world is changing really quickly. And there's lots of, there's lots of noise. Um, there's lots of, um, you know, social media can feel um, very divisive and, um, and very toxic um, I think that a lot of people who want to put forward, um, you know, more hatred or more divisiveness are very savvy in preying upon men, young men who are vulnerable 
specifically because they haven't been able to open up to other people. And so when suddenly they find a group that they, that, that, that provides a group identity, provides community for them, um, that can be very attractive if you feel isolated and alone and you don't belong and no one sees you. Um, so I think that this is not just a question about one's individual health and the health of those around them, but I think this is also part of a bigger social moment where we're yelling at each other a lot because we're not empathetic towards one another. We're not able to see each other and it's hard to be vulnerable at this moment. I'm thinking about these groups that prey on lonely, on lonely guys and boys. And, and also now I'm drawn to think about groups like wise guys. And when I was reading about sort of the activities that they would do, right. Talking about emotional intimacy, talking about feelings, um, building a sense of community. It seems like that is, that is one of the solutions, but it also seems like, gosh, there, there aren't that many of those programs in North America or in the world. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think, again, we wait until there's, like, I think there can be, there's like a lot of hand-wringing right now. And some of it is valid and some of it feels like it's panic for the sake of panic. For instance, when there is a, like a mass shooting or a high school shooting, there is this, you know, what, you know, because typically the, you know, the perpetrators of mass shootings are young white men. And so something like that will happen. And then people will say, what's wrong with young men? Like what, like what, what is happening to young men? Or, you know, we hear a story about, um, you know, a, a girl in high school who has been gang raped by a group of male classmates. And so we are rightly upset and alarmed and fearful, but I think we have not put enough energy into trying to prevent the kind of isolation and the kind of, uh, you know, hostilities that lead to those acts of acts of violence. And so when I think about a program like Wise Guys, which starts when kids are 14, and I think they themselves would think that they could even, if they could start earlier, they would. But I think what it does is, in addition to talking to boys about this is how you, th th this is what it means to be a decent man. This is how it means to be, to treat others with decency and respect. But also it does this radical thing of being radically empathetic towards these boys. So it gives them a safe space to talk. It's non-judgmental. Um, they can ask the questions that they might feel they can't ask in other places. So questions that they think maybe that would be offensive or maybe I'll get in trouble if I ask that or maybe I'll sound stupid if I ask that. So it's not like it's anything goes by any means. I mean, it's moderated and it's thoughtfully moderated. But it does allow a place for boys to tease out these questions that they find confusing and they, and no one is talking to them about it. So, you know, like for a boy to say, I don't know, something that, that they would feel would be perhaps seen as controversial or they get in trouble if they say something like, well, what am I supposed to do if the girl beside me is wearing a really short, tight dress? Like, aren't I supposed to look at her? Like, what am I supposed to do? Right. So something like that, where I think a boy might feel like, am I going to get in trouble if I ask that? Um, I think a group like Wise Guys will, the boy will say that and then they'll talk it through with him. Well, what do you think? How do you, what do you think it means to look at somebody respectfully or what do you think? Is it okay to cat call? Well, how would you feel if someone spoke to you like that? And when you're cat calling a girl, are you showing off for your buddies? Do you think girls are interested in a guy that says some, that sort of yells something sexual at them in the hallway at school? Like, is there a better way to show a girl you're interested in her? And what might that look like? And are you scared to show interest in a girl? So let's talk through what you're afraid of. And if you get rejected, well, what would happen if you got rejected? How would that feel? Let's talk that through. So all of a sudden, it creates this place that so many young men are desperate for to talk through this stuff, which feels very, very scary. Because it's way easier for you know young men to find places that tell them to be mad at girls to feel divided from girls than to find a place where boys can say 
I'm kind of nervous. What if I'm not good looking enough? What if I'm not enough? What if I'm, I don't know, my penis is the wrong size? Or what if I'm not good in bed? Or, or you know, what if she thinks I'm ugly? Or all of those things. Um, that stuff guys want to talk about. And you're right. We don't create a lot of spaces for teenage boys to have honest, vulnerable conversations like that. I never had that growing up. I would have killed for something like that. <laughs> well, I would have killed for something like that now. I don't know if I would have been open to it as a, as a, like as a young man. Because that all everything you're talking about now, I'm I'm down to engage. But back then, I, man, that that would have been a tough sell for me. But I think that if it was more common, if that was just sort of normal, uh, sort of like the like the Dutch have start sex ed at age what four? Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> I think that is the most incredible thing. And so if if we had something like that in place here. Right, which is it's sex education, relationship education, intimacy education from the ages of four on, we probably wouldn't be seeing the sort of damages that that are that we're seeing nowadays, sure, yeah, and I also think, and again, for sure like i I think that for a lot of the boys in programs like the wise guys program, um, these aren't easy conversations, I think they're kind of mortifying conversations in many ways, and that said, um, you know, given how ubiquitous porn is for young people, or even how much more sexualized, you know, pop culture is now than it certainly was for me growing up in the 80s and 90s, like, you know, the access to very graphic sexual images is so much more, it's so much more readily available now. And so I think even for boys who maybe don't want to talk about their own personal stuff, they can kind of go through kind of a, like a roundabout way, because one of the things that programs like wise guys use is they'll say things like they'll talk about porn. They'll talk about like, okay, who watches porn? Every hand goes up. Well, what kind of images do you see of sex in porn? What does that look like? And does that look interesting to you? Do you think that that's how people really have sex? And what, like, what, how do you know if you see the, if you see the women in porn, how do you know that they're finding pleasure? Like, do you think what's happening is giving them pleasure? And so it can kind of distance it by doing it almost as like a media criticism or like learning how to read, you know, and, and I think boys can have questions like, oh, so you mean it's not supposed to look like that? Or girls don't like it when you do that? Or like, and I think that can also be a way for them to get some questions answered because a lot of what I looked at for the book is, you know, how porn is shaping how young people think and talk about sex. I mean, I think the, I think there's not enough conclusive evidence to say that porn is like there's direct harm that comes out of porn, but I think there's a lot of confusion for young people um, when it comes to porn because they're having access to fairly hardcore stuff before they've even had much sexual contact themselves. So, you know, again, when I was growing up, maybe you came across somebody's dad's copy of Playboy. That's so, that's just so, um, um, cute and quaint compared to the access that young people have now. So again, I think that there are a lot of young men who are deeply confused and intimidated by what they see in, in, in pornography or, or the images they see about sexuality or about manliness and pop culture. And so I think in some ways, like even with my own son, like we talk a lot about video games or we talk a lot about like the movies he watches. Or we talk about song lyrics, like he, he's really into rap. And so we just, you know, there's no judgment. Like I don't go in saying what you listen to is terrible but more like, oh, what do you think that, what do you think that's about? Or, you know, when you hear that lyric, what do you think? And, you know, we've had some really great conversations just by, by me trying to engage a bit in the world that he inhabits without judgment and without wanting to shut it down. And that was one of the big learnings that I took away from your book around video games and around music and pop culture is to, uh, instead of sort of banning stuff outright, be curious about what it is that they're consuming and like kind of get like get hip with it get hip no one says that anymore uh, certainly not <laughs> you're, <kids>. not, you're <laughs> not hip Sean <laughs> like familiarize yourself with the content that they're consuming that's that's another way of saying get hip with it <laughs> 
for sure. Um, I would love to switch gears a little bit and move over to like looking at what happens sort of in school for boys. You know, the fact that boys get disciplined more than girls. Actually, what's interesting is when you were, when you were talking about your son, you know, how people were saying, oh, that's just how boys are. Uh, boys will be boys, you know, sort of um, describing away or sort of like uh, rationalizing away uh, behaviors that aren't actually inherently masculine or feminine. And there was this one quote in your book that that's, that says um, that uh, boys... Oh, the idea that boys aren't born boys, they choose to become boys. And, yeah. and that parents and, and educators subtly and, and unconsciously sort of uh, direct boys into being, into the man box, basically. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think that even, so even before boys are in school, you know, there's all kinds of messaging around, um, you know, take clothing, for instance. Um you know, it's changing a little bit now, but anybody who has bought clothes for a toddler or a baby in the last decade um, will know that we are way more pink and blue now than we were, again, in my 70s, 80s instance. Like when I was a toddler, when I see pictures of myself, everything is kind of brown and corduroy and we all dressed alike. We all sort of had matching bowl cuts. And I think that it was impossible when my son was little to buy a onesie for him or jeans for him or a t-shirt for him, like the most basic of outfits that didn't have some gender messaging, that didn't have a, like, we're pink and covered in hearts and unicorns and we're in the girl section or we're blue and had trucks and a dinosaur and we're in the boy section. So even if you, it, it was, it was very hard to go to like a mainstream store of any kind, like a baby gap or, you know, something like that, um, where most people buy their kids clothes, um, and find clothes that weren't gendered in some kind of way. Um, so you start with just something as basic as that with bedding with, you know, I mean, it's fascinating to me that we're in this moment where there are all kinds of the gender reveal parties where when people realize that they're having a boy or a girl, we'll have these parties where they announce to their friends, like the baby we're carrying is a girl or it's a boy. And, you know, they, they do it by you slice open a cake. And if it's pink inside, you're having a girl. And if it's blue inside, you're announcing you're having a boy. You know, it feels kind of weirdly retrograde to imagine that all of us are so neatly divided into all of these qualities associated with pinkness and all of these qualities associated with blueness. I know that there are some biological differences between sometimes there can be in temperament and in development and learning style and all of that is true. And, but a, the jury is still very much out about how much, how much of who we are is solely innate and how much is solely culture. Um, you know, the best, the best answer is that, you know, whatever is, in it, whatever is inborn is in constant uh, flux based on the cultural messages that are either amplifying what we have inborn or pushing down what we have inborn. And, you know, the thing that I noticed when my son went to school were often segregated toys and play areas and a kind of way of looking at girls and boys behavior through a particular kind of, with a particular kind of analysis. So there was the assumption built in that girls liked reading and books and quiet play. And that might be true for a lot of girls, but it's not true for all girls. And that boys wanted rambunctious play and that they were slow readers and they weren't as communicative. And again, that might be true for a lot of boys, not true for all boys, but people really lean into those generalizations. So you can point to all kinds of counter examples of the little girl running around the classroom, loving sports, loving gymnastics, wanting to flip off the monkey bars and take all kinds of physical risks. And you could point to the boy that was kind of quiet and bookish. And still it's like, nope, boys are like this, girls are like that. And when it comes to discipline, certainly, I think those stereotypes also lead into boys and boys and boys of color in particular are much more likely to be harshly disciplined by their teachers. So teachers are more likely to expect a boy, particularly if he is a black boy or an indigenous boy or a Latino boy, teachers were much more likely to anticipate trouble from those boys to be 
keeping their eye on those boys. So even if those boys hadn't done anything wrong, there was the expectation that they would. And when you look at suspension rates, expulsion rates, you see that, you know, young, you see that boys of color are much more likely to be expelled, suspended, harshly disciplined, much less likely to be put into gifted programs or like arts and drama club. So for sure, some of those boys may have acted out in certain ways, but I do think that so much of that is children will live up to the expectations we have for them. So if we hold an expectation that that child, because of their gender or because of their skin color or their class background, if we hold up the expectation that that child is going to be a lawyer or that child is going to go to prison, um, and we all have these inherent biases, children pick up on those expectations. And, and I think that that's what, you know, really came across for me as the mother of a boy who was often on the receiving end of very harsh punishments and was often seen as uh, a bad kid um, rather than a kid who needed help rather than a kid who was struggling, rather than a kid who maybe needed a different classroom environment. He was seen as a kid who was bad. I can relate to a lot of that. I, I was called rambunctious, uh, outspoken, obnoxious, class clown. And it's, uh, you know, frankly, a lot easier to prove them right than it is to prove them wrong. For sure. So, but if they had called me gifted and all the other stuff, then I'd probably be more likely to succeed in that, in, you know, or go into that trajectory. Right. Well, exactly. And also, if you think about the man box, right? If the man box says, boys are supposed to jump around and have big physical energy and boys are supposed to kind of control the room by making people laugh or by dominating. So if you, if you put that expectation out and say, that's the gender expectation, that's what real boys are, real men are. And then if a boy behaves that way in a classroom, we say, oh, you're a troublemaker. So it does become this like, problematic thing. And then I think also if we say to boys, never ask for help, never cry, never show weakness. Um, when a boy is sincerely struggling, maybe because he doesn't, un maybe because he has a learning disability, or maybe because um, he's having problems at home, or maybe because he's being bullied. If he doesn't have a healthy avenue to deal with that struggle, if he can't go to somebody and say, I'm scared or I'm lonely or I'm getting picked on or I don't understand what's happening in the classroom. I, I, I don't know how to read that well and everyone's well ahead of me and I need help. If we say to boys, you must never do that. You must never show your weakness or your vulnerability or your struggle. Um, then those boys are going to find another way to express themselves. If they don't have a healthy outlet to express those emotions, then they're going to express those emotions via bullying themselves or getting into fights or getting into trouble um, or, you know, being lippy with the teacher. They're going to turn that struggle, that pain, that fear into anger, aggression, or shutting down. They're going to they're gonna be the boy either getting in a fight or in the back of the class with his hands across his chest being like, F you, I don't care. I'm done. I'm checked out. Because that, that boy has learned how to regulate his behavior because he's been punished enough. Yeah. And th the issue with that is that we are not addressing the underlying, why is this, why is this child acting out? So they've learned to, they've learned to play by the rules at that point, but for sure, we're not, we're not actually healing. There's no healing or repair happening at that point either. Yeah. And again, I think if we say to boys and if we say to men, the only acceptable emotions you're allowed to show are, um, you know, rage and maybe sexual desire. That's it. That's your, that's your, that's your emotional repertoire. Um, that's not a lot of options. Right. And I think about this in terms of like, you know, boys in school, but, um, you know, a little while ago, there was a picture of, um, it was like on, it was circulating on social media, but a year ago of, um, the actor, Daniel Craig, you know, uh, James Bond, Daniel Craig. Okay. Yeah. And he had a new baby and he was wearing his baby in a snuggly. He, you know, he's like, he's ripped, right? Like he, he was James Bond, right? So he's a super muscly guy. You could not, you could not have a more mock 
macho role than being James Bond. And there is the actor walking around like a happy dad with his baby in one of those baby snugglies. And the, the TV uh, host, Piers Morgan, who's a, you know, a bit of a jerk, made some comment on Twitter, like, oh God, you too, um, James Bond, like you're ruining masculinity. Like this is like, you know, like, can't you be tough? And I just thought, oh my God, here's somebody like making fun of a man for being a dad, for, <laughs> for, holding his own child. And I thought like, how, what a weird world we live in when we have like Piers Morgan, a grown adult man shaming another man for being an attentive father. Like that is messed up. Shaming the most manly man. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. So if you think about the man box, if even James Bond is seen as not living up to the man box. If even his masculinity can be called into question, no wonder so many men live in fear of being seen as less than a man. Like, no wonder there is that fear of being shamed. We probably need to get rid of the man box. We need to get rid of the man box. (laughs) Or, or, Or make the man box like... You know, like a huge, like a, like a huge box that also includes, you know, empathy and kindness and, 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 and redefining strength as showing your vulnerability and redefining strength as not being a bully, but standing up against injustice. Um, you know, like I think that we can, cause I think again, there are qualities in the man box like strength, like courage, um, you know, like competitiveness that aren't necessarily like sort of bad across the board. It's just when they're taken in isolation from other things. Or, you know, if we only define strength as dominance, that's a narrow idea of what strength is, right? And if we only define courage as going to war and not courage being able to stand up in a room full of other men and talk about the fact that maybe you had been sexually assaulted as a child and what that meant for you and how you're working through that trauma. I mean, that is a massive amount of courage, right? So I think if we sort of think, take these, we expand the man box, maybe we get rid of it, maybe we expand it, but I think certainly redefining what we mean when we talk about things like courage or we talk about strength, or even when we talk about being a provider in a family, because you can be a financial provider, but you can also be an emotional provider in a family. You know, you can also provide for your family by showing up for them in really amazing ways. You can be a provider by, um, you know, listening to your partner's struggles and helping them work through something. You can be a provider by, you know, helping your kid with their homework because you're providing that kind of support. So I think it's about like kind of expanding what we mean by these traditional, these traditional rules. You could be a stay at home dad and change diapers. And that is just as manly as the dude, the, the, banker who's, you know, bankrolling his whole family. For sure. For sure. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the men that I know in my life who are more involved in their kids' lives, like, you know, I talk a bit about my dad in the book and the fact that my father was really not involved um, in a hands-on way when I was a kid. And, um, it just, there was nothing like he, you know, he didn't take, he didn't come to my school plays. He didn't take me to the park. He didn't take me to the doctor. Those were things my mother, my mother was a stay at home mom. Um, it just like my father just was really of the the belief that to be a father meant you put food on the table and that's what you did as a father. And my male friends who are, who are dads now, the ones that are the happiest are the ones that um, give a lot of time and energy to their kids. They're the ones that are, you know, splitting the domestic labor 50, 50, you know, they're the ones who are either taking parental leave if they can take it or else they've adjusted their work schedule. So they can pick their kids up at the end of the day or drop them off in the morning um, or they're cooking dinner with their kids the, the, my male friends who are in their, say, 30s and 40s 
find a great deal of meaning in being a hands-on father. And they find a great deal of fulfillment, a great deal of joy. Um, the idea of being a dad and being like a 1950s dad would be so unappealing to them. Like that would be so, like that, that would be so painful for them to not be engaged with their kids in that way. Um, and I think that's a really, a really profound way to be a good, healthy, happy man. If you are, if you, if you want to be a father and are a father to be able to have that engagement, or maybe it's with your, you know, nieces and nephew, or maybe it's coaching a team or whatever it is. I think that that kind of, that kind of hands-on connection is so meaningful for so many men. Well, now what we're talking about, which, which I wanted to touch on was the importance of boys to have role models, right? Where they can see healthy, um, emotional intimacy, vulnerability, cor- courage, uh, a more respectful way of being a man modeled day to day, right? And in, in, in the book, you talk about the importance of uh, students to see a teacher of their race and how black boys, for the most part, 2% of all teachers in America are black men. And that is not that's not the same statistic of, as as how many black boys there are in in the school system, and so for sure they, they don't get to see what a healthy role model of their race looks like. For sure, and you know, and and not only that, there was a really large scale study in the U.S. that found that um, black boys who had just one black male teacher during the entirety of their elementary and and high school education. So one teacher out of, you know, 12 years, they had one black teacher, one black male teacher, they were 40% less likely to drop out of school. So just that small amount of connection with a teacher who looked like them, who in some ways they could feel that they see themselves in, um, made a huge difference in terms of their educational outcome. And so I think when we think about role models, whether they're role models in terms of parents, family members, teachers, and coaches, um, showing boys ways of being um, manly or male or a good, strong man in ways that aren't limited and toxic, and um, but are actually expansive and caring. And in 2016, uh, just before the U.S. election, um, when the Access Hollywood tape was released with Donald Trump talking about, you know, grabbing a woman by the by her genitals, um, I, there was a coach, a football coach in West Texas, who was truly he's a guy truly out of Friday Night Lights, like really like old school Christian football coach. And not the kind of guy you'd think would be particularly woke and particularly sort of progressive in his politics. And when he heard Donald Trump talking about the fact that that language was locker room talk, he was personally affronted by that because he felt that as a coach and as a man, he wanted to be a role model to boys and young men of being respectful towards women, that that he wanted his team, and that was a value for his team, that his boys needed to stop bullying. They needed to be leaders in terms of being empathetic, being kind, elevating everybody up, that it, that it wasn't about being cliquish and the kind of big man on campus to be a member of his football team meant that you cared for the most vulnerable, that you talked about girls. You didn't tell um, sexist jokes about girls. And so he used that moment to talk to the boys on his team about talking to girls and women with respect. You could not imagine a more manly dude than that guy. And he was finding his way into this conversation about joking about grabbing women without their consent that's not what a real man is. And I think that that kind of role modeling in a place where maybe you wouldn't expect those kinds of conversations is really profound. I think the role modeling, even if you look at the Daniel Craig thing of James Bond holding his baby, for boys and young men to see a happy dad, to see that a man who's a dad has a responsibility to look after his kid, that that is, you know, I think seeing those images are really important, whether they're in one's real life or whether they're pop culture images of men expressing their full selves. I think hearing men, like I I heard from a lot of men who talked about when they saw their dad cry, how liberating it was for them to see their father cry or show emotion. 
I have a friend who, a male friend who writes a lot about masculinity as well. When he heard two straight male friends tell each other that they love one another, when he saw that, when he was able, he he had wanted to tell a friend of his how much that friend mattered. The friend was going through a hard time and he wanted to say to his friend, like, I love you and I'm here for you. And it was really hard for him to to do that. And, you know, seeing other men be able to have that kind of to talk to one another in that way was really important to him because it felt like, Oh, if they can do it, I can do it. It gave him permission to be, to be open. I tell a lot of my male friends that I love them every time I get off the phone with them. That's amazing. Yeah. Even if it's a five minute phone call. Yeah. They say it back. It's great. Yeah. I think I started it. You know, and then now they're they're comfortable doing it as well. Mm-hmm. So we can healthy role models isn't just for children and adults; it could be for adults and adults as well. For sure, and I think even in this moment, you know, for instance, like in you know thinking about the Me Too mo- movement, and you know having men talk about, you know, their experiences of having experienced abuse and harassment. I think those have been really powerful, powerful voices. And, you know, here in Toronto, um, there had been an incident at a uh, private boys school of um, sexual assault happening as sort of part of a hazing ritual that um, a group of uh, a group of students on um, one of the sports teams had um, bullied other students. And in one case, they threw a kid in a sink and got him really wet and kind of pinned him down. And in another case, they used a broomstick to sexually assault another kid uh, while he was being held down. And this happened in a very prestigious a uh, boys' school uh, with an ex like an excellent academic program, an excellent sports program. This is a, a Catholic private school that you know people kind of clamor to get their kids into because the kids that go there often get accepted into very prestigious colleges and universities, either in Canada or the U.S. The the bullying, the the the, the violence had been videotaped and it, it was brought to police attention, and there had been a real reckoning um, at the school and a number of men who were graduates of the school have since come forward to say that happened to me, that happened to me, that I I was bullied in that way. I was sexually assaulted at the school. Um, I was terrorized every day. And many of these guys are like six foot five, 250 pound, you know, football players. And I think the role modeling that they also set in coming forward and showing their vulnerability in saying, I was traumatized and I was hurt and I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody about it. And I don't want that to happen to somebody else. I mean, I think those are also really profound voices that we we, we're, we're, we're hearing a bit more from now in terms of, of talking about what it means to have been harmed and hurt and the very vulnerable process of healing from that. This sort of reminds me of this bit of your book where it says, um, we need to teach them, boys, how to talk about their feelings and give them permission to ask for help. We need to create opportunities for them to be tender and nurturing, expressive and vulnerable. We need to talk to them about sex and love and communication. But even more than that, we need to listen and learn from them. We need to look at boys not as a homogenous mass, but rather in all their complexity, individuality and humanity. There are plenty of boys and young men already leading this charge. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I was at, so, um, I was this past fall, I was my, my book kind of start, my book started in Calgary with that story that I wrote that then became the book. And I was back in Calgary in the fall and I was asked to speak at a middle school. And so I wasn't really, they didn't really tell me what they wanted. So I thought, okay, I'll just go in and I'll talk to these students about, I'll do a gender one-on-one with them. And so I just, instead of talking at them, I was like, okay, what, 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 like, tell me what it means to be a boy and tell me what it means to be a girl. Like, what, what, what do you think that the, what do you think that is? Like, what do you think the rules are for being a girl? And what do you think the rules are for being a boy? And then what is the best thing about being a girl? What is the best thing about being a boy? What is the worst? And so I was just getting them to talk about what they thought the rules were and what they, what they liked, what they rejected. And the conversation got really pretty, it was a pretty intense experience. Like it was, I'm not sure that I think the teachers were a little like, what are you doing? Um, but it was really, really great. It was a really good conversation, but there was a boy who was one of the, the kids were seated sort of grade sevens at the front, eights behind them and nines in the back. And the grade nines were pretty, um, 
you know, they were kind of dismissive and kind of jokey and telling a lot of crude jokes. And the grade eights were sort of midway there, but the grade sevens, they're still little, they're only 12. And so they were still pretty raw and pretty vulnerable. And they were the ones that I think had the most interesting and unfiltered answers to the question. And at one point, someone said, uh, a girl said, a younger girl, so a grade seven girl said, I think the best thing about being a girl is that you actually can like, you know, have a good friend and like you can hold hands with your female friend and you can tell her your feelings. And if you cry, no one thinks you're dumb. And like, that's, that's what it's like. I think that maybe that's not, boys don't have that. And this boy in her age group, you know, raised his hand and he said, he said, yeah, I said, I, 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 yeah, I think so. And he said, I feel like, you know, people keep telling me to push my emotions down and my feelings down. And he said, and sometimes I'm worried if I keep pushing them down, that I'm not going to be able to find them when I need them. And I just thought, oh my God, he's like, this is a 12 year old who's saying, I'm not going to be able to find my feelings when I need them. Like he, this, this, this is how he's understood what it means to be a boy. And when you think about the consequences of, of what you do to yourself, if you shove your feelings down and then what, it, what it makes you capable of doing to others, if you shove your feelings down, I mean, that, that is the root of so many of the problems we're talking about, you know, in our culture right now. And so, you know, when you read that line back from the book, I felt like, you know, the year later when I went back, I felt like I had that opportunity to listen to a young man saying to me, like, I don't want to shove my feelings down. Like the world is telling me to shove my feelings down. And I'm aware of the consequences of that. So when people say like, this is what boys are like, boys are like this and girls are like that, or boys are naturally stoic or they're naturally unfeeling. I could point to so many examples where I've heard from boys and young men that they want to talk about their feelings. They want someone to listen to them. They want to have these hard conversations. They're just, they're, they are just waiting for us to show up for them. Like they are waiting for someone to give them permission. And I think that, you know, in the same way, like when I think about when you asked sort of what led me to write the book, I, as a woman, I don't like being seen as I don't like to be generalized about, and I don't want to be told there's only one way to be female. There's only one way that I can be in the world. Um, I want to be all the complex things that I am. And I think the great gift of feminism in terms of saying to girls and women, you can be like, you should go and be your full self. Don't be defined by these limitations. I feel like those same principles can be applied to boys and men that, we don't have to live up to these stereotypes and generalizations. We can be bigger and more expansive and more playful and more open and more fluid. And we can define for ourselves what it means to be who we are. We don't have to define ourselves by some rules that are being placed on us. And the more we can do that, the less restrictive the box becomes, because then we can see other people acting in ways that might not that don't fit into a box and that's totally fine as long as it's done with respect and love and and caring contrary to popular belief being vulnerable will not kill you exactly it won't exactly. kill you it won't kill you it might actually lead to more love and more intimacy absolutely 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 and you know and i think that this is um I think that I think that men and boys can approach this moment and clamp down and hang on more tightly. And certainly we're seeing that we're seeing, you know, a lot of a lot of backlash in this moment. Um, but I do think a lot of boys and men are really embracing the opportunities in this moment to think about, man, how, how can I be a part of the solution and making the world more equitable? And how can I be part of a personal solution and making myself more emotionally healthy? And those seem like really good things. Like I just, I feel like, I, I feel like, I feel like that, that, that is, that is a tremendous, that, that there is a tremendous opportunity for boys and men that doesn't, that doesn't require, you know, taking anything away from them except stuff that I think can be pretty stifling. I'm, I'm 100% on board. Thank you so much for your work. I love this book. I'm excited to recommend it. And I just, I really want to thank you again for, for doing, for doing this work and for showing up today and, and sharing your thoughts with me. 
Oh, thank you so much. It was just such a pleasure. And it was such a, like, it was just, it was a great conversation. These were such great questions. And I just really appreciated you, your interest. And uh, it was like such a pleasure to talk to you. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Lovebird, for spending another hour with me this week. Um, I'm going to say it again. It means the world to me. If you noticed the clicking sound and you think that was annoying, I agree with you. I've switched to a new remote recording software. And that software costs money. Actually, all the software costs money. And the hosting and the equipment and the books that I buy so that I can read them before the interviews. All of this costs money. And the Love Drive is self-funded. I have no advertisers, no sponsors. And so if you believe in this work and you want the Love Drive to continue and you want weekly episodes on emotional intimacy, love, authenticity, sexuality, then I invite you to put your money where your heart is and become a contributing lovebird for as little as $3 a month. $3 a month, it helps because your $3 gets combined with other people's $3 and it allows me to pay for the services that make this show possible. So if you want to help, I would be eternally grateful for any amount that is meaningful to you. Go to thelovedrive.com forward slash join. That's J-O-I-N to become a monthly contributing lovebird. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful week.